Welcome to today's Lindsay Lecture. Welcome to today's Lindsay Lecture. My name is Kirk Ludwig, and I'm the chair of the philosophy department. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2020 Distinguished Lindsay Undergraduate Lecturer in Philosophy, David Chalmers. And also to welcome him back to Indiana University, where he received his dual PhD in philosophy and cognitive science almost 30 years ago under the direction of Mike Dunn and Douglas Hofstadter, who are both here today. And Rob Goldstone was on the committee, and I bet Rob is here somewhere as well, or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, Safe bet, right, yeah. Uh, the Lindsay Lectures are made possible by the generous support of John, Julia, and Ellis Lindsay and the IU Office of the Bicentennial. Uh, Ellis Lindley, Lindsay was an undergraduate here at Indiana University and a philosophy major, and he wanted to give back to the university by providing support for public lectures directed at a general undergraduate audience in philosophy to bring in distinguished philosophers, and I think we have a really a great communicator here today. We're going to have the talk will go for an hour and we'll have a brief break so if people need to leave they can leave and there will be 30 minutes of discussion afterwards and there are two microphones set up at either side of the room and if you have questions come up and get in the queue and we'll just take them in order. Now Professor Chalmers is a university professor and professor of philosophy and neuroscience at New York University where he's also co-director with Ned Block of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness. He is also, as you'll see in a moment, proof that you can be a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and wear a biker jacket. That is, it turns out an actual category of clothing. If you go to Amazon and type in biker jacket, you'll get the right category. Professor Chalmers is perhaps best known, not for the biker jacket, though that's kind of famous, but for his work on the hard problem of consciousness, a phrase he introduced for the problem of understanding how specifically phenomenal consciousness, the feel of pain, the taste of pineapple, the look and smell of red roses, and so on, arises from the physical stuffs out of which our bodies are constructed. In this connection, he is famous for the zombie argument, and no, I know what you're thinking, but it is not about a metaphysical formula for raising the dead and reanimating corpses. It is about philosophical zombies, creatures who might even be physical duplicates of any of us, but who have no phenomenal consciousness for whom everything is dark inside. Now, curiously, this is a little bit of an aside, but I think the world needs to know this. I discovered that Professor Chalmers is the lead singer of the zombie blues band which headlined at the Qualia Fest in 2012. I don't know, however, whether he is a pea zombie, that is a philosophical zombie, or a real zombie, or just a virtual zombie, though I understand there's not much difference between those two, as we'll learn in a moment. But he's made similar, seminal contributions beyond consciousness and music. With Andy Clark, he introduced the extended mind thesis and argued for it. That's the thesis that the boundaries of the mind and its cognitive processes extend beyond the boundaries of the body. Nowadays, I think most of my mind's in my iPhone, so I'm a true believer here. He's made important contributions to the theory of reference and to what is called two-dimensional semantics, and don't worry about what that means. He wrote an enormous and fascinating book, Constructing, Constructing the World, about the fundamental nature of reality in which the phenomenal plays a foundational role. And he's also been writing and thinking lately about the nature of virtual reality, and he's going to tell us, I think, that it's not so bad. So please join me in welcoming and in welcoming back to Indiana University, Professor David Chalmers. Thanks so much, Kirk, and uh, thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for coming back. Um, and thanks also to the, uh, to the IU Bicentennial Foundation and the, uh, the Lindsay family for, for uh, putting on this, uh, this visit as the, uh, the visiting undergraduate lecturer. It's really been a great experience for, uh, 
for me, I've had so many great meetings the last uh, couple of days with, uh, with students from all over IU, from philosophy, cognitive science, and other areas. I've, I've learned a lot from these, uh, from these conversations. I hope the students have got something out of it, uh, too. It's an amazing group of, uh, of students I've interacted with here at IU. I look forward to seeing at least some of you in, uh, in future years as you go on to become the graduate students in philosophy and cognitive science and you know, the researchers of the future and eventually the, uh, eventually the distinguished undergraduate visitor back to, uh, back to Indiana in 30 years time as it, uh, as it were for, uh, for, uh, for one or more of you. Um, but uh, my topic today is, uh, is the virtual and the real. It's a philosophical reflection on virtual reality Technology. I think of this as an instance of the genre I like to call techno-philosophy, which is a combination of the philosophical analysis of technology and the use of analysis of technology to illuminate traditional philosophical problems. In this name, I'm um, inspired by the philosopher Patricia Church Churchland, who talked of neuro-philosophy. I was influenced by reading her book, neurophilosophy years ago um, when, I was a, when I was a student, and she used this as a combination of the philosophical analysis of neuroscience, but also, crucially, the use of neuroscience to illuminate philosophical problems. It's kind of a two-way um, two street of communication between the neuroscience and the philosophy, and I think very much the same comes up with, uh, with technology. So I've been interested in philosophically thinking about technology and using technology to think about philosophical Problems. So, I mean, one way to come at this is to note that much philosophy concerns the analysis of the mind, of the world, and the relation between them. You know, the philosophy of mind or consciousness thinks about the mind. Metaphysics, the philosophy of physics concerns the world, the epistemology and the, uh, the philosophy of language and the philosophy of science, all in one way or another about the connection between the mind and the world. And I think these philosophical questions can very often be illuminated by thinking about artificial minds and artificial worlds. I think in the case of artificial minds, this has become a fairly familiar strategy by now. Thinking about artificial minds, well, here the key, the key case is artificial intelligence technology, um, where you've got computer systems and raise the question, can they come to have minds? But also there's the case of augmented minds. Um, Kirk mentioned the extended mind and the idea that technology we use might serve to extend our cognitive system and maybe enhance our minds. So once you've got these issues about, once you've got artificial and augmented minds, there are some immediate philosophical questions. Are artificial minds genuine minds or are they just sort of fake or pseudo minds? Um, do they have the same value as non-artificial mind. And indeed, you can say the same thing for augmented mind. Is augmenting your mind with an iPhone, is that really genuinely something mental? Um, do you generally have mental states via these uh, mind augmentations or not? And there's, a lot of there's been a lot of philosophical debate about these issues. But today, minds are not really going to be my central topic, although they'll come up on the way. Rather, the focus is artificial worlds. Um, in particular, the kind of artificial worlds generated through virtual reality technology, and more generally, virtual worlds of the kind that can be can be used with uh, can be built with digital technology. Even the virtual worlds of video games will be part of the uh, the purview of my talk. But maybe the core case will be virtual reality of the kind you might get with, say, a VR headset. Also, augmented worlds of the kind you get through augmented or mixed reality technology, as with, you know, someone's wearing a, um, augmented reality glasses when you can see the physical world, but project digital, digitally based images into the world there too. And these are all, you know, these are getting a lot of uptake now in current technology, in, uh, in popular culture. There are movies like his Ready Player One that illustrates, you know, people who spend a whole lot of their time hanging out in a, uh, in a virtual world based with, uh, with VR headsets. Well, that's science fiction, but the technology is rapidly becoming real. Um, so just as with artificial minds, artificial worlds, 
raise some analogous philosophical questions. You know, is, just as we asked, are artificial minds genuine minds? We could ask, is virtual reality genuine reality? And does it, in principle, have the same kind of value as non-virtual reality? Now I'm going to argue for a generally positive answer to these questions. I think that virtual reality can be seen as, it's not a form of fake or pseudo reality. In my view, it's a form of genuine reality. And one can, in principle, have you know, equally meaningful experiences in a virtual reality. But that'll take a while. Here's, um, here's VR technology as it, in kind of the standard form as it exists today. It's typically with something like a VR headset that gives you an immersive experience of being in a three-dimensional world, maybe with some controllers that, uh, that interact with this and that control your actions within a virtual world. I mean, we can start by trying to define virtual reality. Here's one definition. A virtual reality environment is an immersive, interactive, computer-generated environment. I could go through what immersive and interactive and computer-generated really mean, but I think maybe it's easier just to illustrate them, illustrate them with pictures. So here's immersiveness. Not virtual reality. The, uh, the virtual world off, off on a desktop, virtual reality. When it's, uh, when, it's strapped to your, uh, when it's strapped to your face and you're, you have the experience of the 3D world all around you, that's immersive. You've got this sense of presence at the center of the world. The world is really um, surrounding you. Typically, that's regarded as a condition for genuine virtual reality. Desktop video game, although maybe a virtual world is not full-on virtual reality. Also important is Interactivity, you can make a difference to the, uh, the virtual world. This is a picture of me playing virtual tennis um, at the US Open, no less, against M virtual Maria Sharapova. There was a, uh, I went to the US Open a couple of years ago, and I was delighted to discover they had this whole VR exhibit where, um, where you could play virtual tennis against virtual Sharap Sharapova. And I like this because it looks like I know what I'm doing. And you know, it's interactive. Um, so I'm actually hitting the, tennis, the virtual tennis ball back over the virtual net. After a few minutes, it even went in once or twice. <laughs> um, so, you know, actually making a difference to the virtual world. If it's passive, it doesn't count. And most important condition is computer generation. The idea that the virtual world you're interacting with is somehow grounded in a set of computer processes, which are maybe running some kind of physics-based or other simulation of a... Uh, of a world, and it's those computer processes that ground um, the events and interactions in that world. So core VR, we might say, is VR that meets all three of those conditions. It's immersive, it's interactive, it's computer generated. And the VR through a standard headset, headset, these are things like the Oculus Quest and the HTC Vive and the uh, Oculus Rift before them, and so on. They're, these are all instances of core VR. You can drop these conditions one at a time. Say we, we drop the immersiveness condition just for interactiveness and computer generation. You get something like screen-based virtual worlds. As here's a picture of World of Warcraft on a, on a desktop screen, not fully immersive. Still, you might think of it as a borderline case of virtual reality. You can drop the interactiveness condition. This is a 360 video. People just basically watch films through a VR headset, and then it's immersive. Um, it may well be computer generated, but uh, it's not interactive. What you do doesn't have any effect on the world, except for maybe very minimal things like changing your, your perspective. Again, I think not standardly regarded as full-scale VR, but perhaps a borderline case. Now, what's immersive and interactive, but not computer generated? Well, here's one possibility. Ordinary physical reality. I'm not, uh, I'm not completely sure about this one as a case because, you know, people do speculate that maybe ordinary reality may be some form of simulation or virtual reality. But assuming that speculation is wrong, then, yeah. Um, because ordinary reality does seem to meet these conditions of being immersive and interactive. That's what makes, you know, that's the part that makes virtual reality reality, if you like. The part that makes it virtual is computer generation. There are other cases of immersion interaction without computer Generation. Here's telepresence. Somebody, uh, somebody operating a surgeon, you know, operating remotely through a 
VR headset for op operating on a patient, and I think that's often regarded as you know, a kind of borderline case of VR, despite not really having any direct computer generation there. And there's partial computer generation of your reality. This is the case of augmented or mixed reality, which is now, I mean, I think there's been a lot of excitement over VR in the technology space over the last, say, uh, maybe five years or so now. I think it's now, it entered a very a high up cycle of, uh, of hype for a while. I think now it's somewhere on the down cycle. People have words for this, and you end the, the, the uh, what is it, the, the rise of excitement and the trough of depression, and then the, uh, the gradual, stable reattainment of balanced expectations. Right now, some of the hype is with augmented. Um, augmented reality, people think, okay, maybe once we actually all are wearing these augmented reality glasses, we'll do a whole lot of our computing this way. Eventually, we won't need um, smartphones and desktops. It'll all be projected uh, before us. We're not there yet, but uh, it looks like you know, companies like Apple, Facebook are developing these, these products, and that's going to give you partially computer-generated reality. You still see ordinary physical reality, but digital objects projected in there too. So that'll be part of my purview. This all, here my focus is very much on the you know, virtual reality of today and of the relatively near-term future. In the past, I've talked about and I've written about the kinds of very speculative science fiction scenarios, the whole world being virtual reality, for example. Maybe the most famous example of this is the movie The Matrix. Some of us were talking about this today and yesterday. And in some, some other work, I've tried to argue that if you're in... A simulated world, like the Matrix, nonetheless, that counts as a genuine reality. It's not the case that the Matrix is an illusion. It's actually a way of being in a genuine world. It's just a world made, constituted by some digital processes. But that's not my focus today. Here I'm, in a way, trying to take some of the lessons from previous thinking about uh, the permanent VR case and applying it to the more realistic, for now, scenario of temporary virtual reality. It's not the idea that people have been living their whole life in VR, but the idea that you might enter VR for a while, as people do, put on a headset and stay there for, for you know, 30 minutes or, or two hours and interact with the world and then come out, or maybe go in for longer periods. Again, here's Ready Player One, where people might go in for, you know, a day or so at a, uh, at a time. They'll spend most of their time there for weeks, but still, you know, they know they're in there. They've got the choice to come out, I'm interested in the, uh, the status of these worlds. And, you know, a, a, uh, a edge case would be something like, you know, just a random game of you know, plants versus zombies or something you play on your, uh, on, your, on your smartphone. Some of these issues may even apply to that kind of virtual world. So, okay, just a tiny bit more on terminology. A virtual world, I'm going to say, is an interactive computer-generated environment. I don't require immersion for that. So the world of a video game, say on a smartphone, can count as a virtual world, even though it's not full-scale VR. I think that's just fairly standard terminology here. Virtual objects are the objects contained in virtual worlds that we perceive and interact with, or at least that we seem to perceive and interact with. Uh, most notably, things like avatars, our virtual bodies, the bodies we use for, um, for interaction in, um, in virtual worlds, virtual buildings, virtual treasures, virtual you know, monsters and, uh, and whatever is in your virtual world. And you know, virtual objects and virtual worlds immediately raise for a number of philosophical questions. These are going to structure the talk, the rest of the talk, around four philosophical questions about virtual objects and virtual worlds and thinking about whether they are real or not. First question, are virtual objects real or are they merely fictional or perhaps illusory? Do virtual events really happen? Third, are virtual experiences illusory or non-illusory? And fourth, are experiences in VR as valuable or as meaningful as experiences outside it? Or can they be as valuable or as meaningful in principle? And here you can go you know, a couple of different ways. The set of views I'm going to defend I call virtual realism. realism in the philosopher's sense, we are a realist about something, is to say that it's real. Yesterday I talked about realism, about consciousness, which is the view that consciousness is real. 
Today, the idea is realism about virtual objects, the view that virtual objects are real. So virtual realism answers these questions as follows. First, virtual objects are real. Second, virtual events really happen. Third, virtual experiences are, or at least can be, non-illusory. And fourth, experiences in VR can be, at least in principle, as valuable, meaningful, as experiences outside VR. This view contrasts with virtual irrealism. The irrealist is someone who says something is not real. Uh, virtual irrealism, no surprise, says virtual objects are not real. Virtual events don't really happen. Virtual experiences are illusory, and experiences in VR are less valuable than experiences outside it. Then, you know, what philosophers have written about virtual worlds and virtual reality to, to date? I think virtual irrealism has tended to be the dominant view. Uh, a particular form of virtual irrealism called virtual fictionalism that I'll get to, where virtual realities are fictions. So I'll get to that in a second. But also in popular culture, you know, when you hear about, you know, the Matrix, people even in the promotions for the Matrix, if you're in the Matrix, reality is a hoax. It's, uh, it's what it says somewhere. Or in the, uh, in the movie, Ready Player One, all about these virtual worlds. At one point, a character utters the uh, immortal sentence, reality is the only thing that's real. Can you think about that for a second? What is that all about? <laughs> first of all, it sounds like it's a tautology. Well, of course, realities are real. Second, it sounds like it's an oxymoron or a category mistake. It's like saying happiness is happy, reality is real. But I think actually, when you think about it, what they're, what they're really trying to say here is that physical reality is the only thing that's real and that virtual reality is not really, is not fully real. It's somehow, yeah, virtual reality is fine as, a, as an escape and so on, but it's not genuinely real. So this slogan is actually expressing a virtual irrealist, um, a virtual irrealist philosophy, and that's a philosophy which I'm gonna argue is wrong. So as I said, this dominant view of virtual worlds to date has been, I think, that virtual worlds and virtual objects are fictional. Their ontological status, their status as entities in reality, is like that of, I don't know, Middle Earth and Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. There's this land of Middle Earth, and does it really exist? No, it exists in a fiction. There's a book about it, and there's a, there are movies about it, and so on, that talk about it, but it's not a place which is real. And likewise, it's a fictional place. And likewise, Gandalf is a fictional character, not a real, not a real person or a real wizard or whatever Gandalf's category is. Um, so the dominant view is that virtual worlds are somehow like that. Um, virtual objects are fictional objects. Virtual events take place only in fictional worlds. Virtual events, virtual experiences involve illusory perception of a fictional world. And experiences in VR have the sort of value that engagement with fiction has. And that's by no means to say they're valueless. You know, I think we all know there's a lot of value to be gained from engagement with works of fiction, from literature, from films, and so on. Still, it's a relatively limited and specific kind of value, the value you get from engagement with fiction. By no means does it cover you know, the, broad, the broad spectrum of engagement you get with, um, with you know, engagement with reality of, of all kinds. I think the virtual realist view would be in fact, you can get the full spectrum of value from experiences in VR, not just this limited sort. And you find this view, virtual fictionalism, William Gibson, the science fiction author in his classic Neuromancer, said cyberspace, by which he, I think he meant virtual reality, is a consensual hallucination. Um, it's, a, uh, it's basically uh, something that you know, we sort of collectively make up. It's not real. Uh, my colleague at NYU, David Velleman, has a wonderful piece, Virtual Selves, where he says, virtual play is governed by a single master fiction, that they're viewing live images of a shared world. So these are instances of the kind of virtual fictionalism I want to argue against. Now, I think there's definitely something to virtual fictionalism. I think something, I mean, something in the vicinity is, uh, is probably right, and there's certainly an insight there. I mean, at the very least, I think, many video games, um, it's very plausible that they involve Fictional worlds. Here's an easy case. Take a Lord of the Rings, a Lord of the Rings video game set in Middle Earth. If you're inclined to think, you know, Middle Earth in the uh, in the books is a fictional place, and Middle Earth in the uh, in the movies is a fictional place, 
it looks like you know, Middle Earth in the, uh, in the video game is also a fictional place. Or another easy case, uh, video games with alternative courses, say, of the, uh, the Second World War. Maybe um, you know, people go back and kill Hitler in 1943. So here's a Second World War video game. It looks like, okay, what's happening here is fictional. It did not actually happen in 1943. It's an alternative course of reality. But what I want to say is, I think, yeah, these video games do involve fictions, but they involve fictions not because they're virtual, but because they're games, because they're role-playing games. You can get exactly the same thing going with a, say, a play version of, uh, of Lord of the Rings, a reenactment of the Second World War. This can involve some kind of conveil of a fictional circumstance, but that's a very, you know, that's kind of, in some ways, orthogonal to whether it's virtual or not. not I mean, for a start, not all video games involve fictions. You know, take an old game like Pong, the one where the, uh, the ball bounces back and forth between a couple of, of lines. I mean, some people say that's just a fictional depiction of tennis. And actually, it's like it's modeling like a tennis game. It's a really, really bad fictional depiction of tennis, if that's what it is. I think, no, it's just a genuine world where you're, you just have interactions between digital objects in a digital world. There's no obvious fiction there. Or to take another one, Second Life, I'll come back to, to this case. Virtual worlds used not for game purposes, but say for... for social interaction purposes or education or communication purposes, um, they don't seem to involve fictions. And indeed, not all virtual worlds are game worlds. So I think a better case is something like, um, say, a social VR environment. I think the best known is probably still Second Life, even though it's not as widely used. It's certainly the, most, the best known uh, social virtual world. It hasn't really been ported to VR because there are technical difficulties. Now there are a whole lot of social environments for VR, uh, such as Sansar and VR Space, Alt VR. None of them have really caught on as much as Second Life did back in the day. So I'll stick with Second Life as my example. Just say, so here's, a, here's Second Life. Um, some people go into a room, a virtual room. They're avatars. They have a conversation. So um, yeah, so two people's avatars walk into a room and talk with each other in Second Life. Is there a fiction here? What's the fiction? So you might want to say it's fictional that they have these avatars. It's fictional there's a room. It's fictional that the avatars are in it. None of that is really happening. I want to say that is the wrong attitude to Second Life and to virtual worlds. I want to say people really do have these avatars. Yeah, those avatars are not their physical bodies. They are virtual bodies that those people are inhabiting. The, uh, the room is a virtual room, not a physical room. The avatars really are in the virtual room, just as they seem to be. There's nothing fictional about that. So that's an initial statement of the kind of virtual realism that I like, that I'll go on to defend. So that gets us to the first question. Are virtual objects real, or are they fictional? OK, so what is? Um, it's one thing to say, I want to say these virtual objects, like avatars, for example, are real. What are they? I think a virtual object like an avatar is a digital object. It's constituted by computational processes. Most likely, it's something like a data structure inside a concretely running computer program or something constituted by a bunch of data structures. There are really interesting questions here about just what kind of data structures and how to individuate them. Some of these have been coming out recently in a symposium on virtual reality that's been uh, going on, and there are really fascinating questions about just what they are. But first approximation, it's a data structure constituted by a pattern of bits inside a, uh, inside a computer. I think it's plausible that every virtual object in a virtual world corresponds to a data structure or perhaps a, a group of data structures. When I see a virtual object, it's this data structure that's causing my experience. When two virtual objects interact, it's these data structures that are interacting. So it's really data structures that in some ways have the causal powers in virtual worlds. So there's a way to turn this into an argument for a kind of virtual realism, the view that, and in particular, the view that I call virtual digitalism, that virtual objects are digital objects. This is what I call the argument from causal powers. Premise one, virtual objects have certain causal powers, uh, for example, the powers to affect other virtual objects, to affect users, and, uh, and so on. You know, avatars have effects on other 
on other avatars, on users. And what has those causal powers? Well, it looks like it's digital objects that really have those causal powers and nothing else does. Somebody once said maybe it's like the images on the screen that have those causal powers. But I mean, they have some effects on users, but I think they're not good candidates for being identified with the underlying objects like avatars, which are visible on many screens. Um, OK, so digital objects really have those causal powers. Nothing else does. Put those together. Conclusion, virtual objects are digital objects. I certainly don't want to say this is a knockdown argument against the virtual fictionalist. The virtual fictionalist might well deny premise one, saying virtual objects um, don't really have certain causal powers. They only have causal powers in the fiction. But nonetheless, I think this can provide some kind of motivation for the view. Here's another argument, argument from perception. When using virtual reality, we perceive virtual objects. It's very, very plausible to say, you know, you see a, um, a virtual ball or an avatar or a virtual building inside VR. Second premise, the objects we perceive are the causal basis of our perceptual experiences. It's what brings them about. That's a fairly standard view about the objects of perception. Third premise, when using VR, the causal bases of our perceptual experiences are digital objects. What's actually bringing about our experiences are ultimately processes inside the computer. Conclusion, virtual objects are digital objects. There are two arguments. Again, not a knockdown argument. Um, a virtual fictionalist may want us to deny that we actually perceive any objects at all in VR. Maybe it's a form of hallucination, they're going to say, and there's no actual objects we're perceiving. We merely seem to. Still, again, I think this can provide some motivation for this view that I like, that I call virtual digitalism. So that's my alternative to virtual fictionalism. Virtual objects are digital objects that really exist. Virtual events or digital events that really happen. Virtual experiences involve non-illusory perception of a digital world, and life inside digital virtual reality is, or at least I want to say can be, about as valuable as life outside. I've done a little bit in the way of defending the first premise, the first claim so far. Now I'll get to the other three questions. So the second question is, do virtual events really happen? I mean, you might say, okay, well, yeah, okay, maybe these virtual objects are digital objects. Still, they don't have the properties that they seem to have. You know, it seems that, to me that, for example, there's a red object over there or an object which is moving from one place to another. And nothing is really red like that. Nothing is really moving like that. Those events don't really happen. The objects don't really have those properties. So, yeah, so even if virtual objects are digital objects, my opponent might say digital objects don't have the properties that virtual objects seem to have, color, size, motion. Maybe my avatar is a certain shade of red, a very wild shade of red, nothing actually anywhere nearby in physical reality has that shade of red. No real object has that shade of red. Okay, so maybe that doesn't have to be an illusion. So I guess here what I want to say is my avatar is not red in the ordinary sense, but we can say it's virtually red. And the digital object is virtually red too. Virtual redness is different from physical redness, but interestingly analogous. Okay, so you might say, what is this virtual redness? Well, here's a common analysis of colors um, by philosophers thinking about color perception. Here's one common view. Redness is something like the power to cause reddish experiences under normal conditions. There's a certain kind of experiences we have of a certain, uh, a certain color. I guess this, uh, this carpet is some kind of dark reddish thing. Where is the, uh, where is the are you red when you need it? There's a, uh, there's a fire, um, a fire alarm. Um, that causes a certain kind of appear perceptual experience in you, and it's the kind we count as red. And we count things like that, things that cause experiences like that, we count them as red. There are closely related views where we count the red things as things with the physical constitution that normally brings about redness. The details won't matter too much here. Anyway, we can just develop precisely analogous views of virtual redness, where physical redness is power to cause reddish experiences under physically normal conditions. Virtual redness is roughly the power to cause reddish experiences under normal for VR.
conditions. And the conditions normal for VR, of course, are quite distinctive, like wearing a headset, playing with, interacting with certain programs. Um, and then digital objects, I think, could actually have those powers. Certain properties of certain data structure properties encoded in data structures actually tend to bring about experiences like this. And then we can say the digital object really is virtually red. Um, just as physical redness is individuated partly in terms of its effects on your experience, same for virtual redness. You can also identify virtual distances, virtual shapes, and so on for virtual objects. Just as we pick down colors via their effects on color experience, I've at least argued we should pin down spatial properties as effects on spatial experiences. A few of you may have been here eight years ago when I gave a talk um, defending a kind of spatial functionalism and arguing that we pick out space as the causal basis of spatial experience. I was also talking about this in a class earlier today. This is a view I like called spatial functionalism, where we pick out space in general via its effects on us. Well, I think just as we, that's meant originally as a view for physical space. We pick it out via its causal role, its effects on interaction, and its effects on perception. I think you can do the same thing, actually, for virtual space. So space is what plays a role in certain kind of effects on us. Likewise, virtual space is what plays that kind of space when using that kind of role when using virtual reality. There's a, there's a slogan that I really like here. It takes um, the, idea, the old idea, there's no action at a distance, and instead of using that as an interesting property of interaction, uses it as a kind of defining feature of distance. Um, we say distance is what there's no action at. So distance is kind, kind of a measure of certain kinds of causal distance. Brian Cantwell Smith, who used to be here, uh, put forward this, uh, this slogan, which I think can be adapted for spatial functionalist purposes. Anyway, the, rough, the details don't matter too much, but the rough idea is that virtual space can emerge from patterns of causal interactions of data structures and certain effects on, on us. And that's what makes it the case that there is virtual space. Same for virtual redness. Um, OK, third question. Are virtual experiences illusory? OK, so you might say, come with me this far. Virtual objects or digital objects, maybe they have some virtual properties. We can define like virtual redness and virtual Squareness, but still you might think there's something illusory about our relationship to VR. Virtual objects seem to be out there in physical space with physical properties like ordinary physical redness and squareness. They seem to be physical objects surrounding us in a three-dimensional physical space, and they're just not. Nothing is out there like that in physical space. So that seems to be an illusion or perhaps a fiction. I want to allow there can be illusions and fictions here, but I also want to say that at least for many users of temporary VR, many or most experiences will not be illusory. And here I want to work up to this by an analogy with another case, the case of mirrors. I want to ask an analogous question. Is ordinary experience on looking at a mirror illusory? Okay, so think about this for a moment. You know, you look into a mirror, in the morning, and you, know, you see someone, you see yourself in the mirror. And does this involve an illusion? Are you somehow getting the world wrong when you see it this way? There's roughly two views you can take. I mean, the illusion view is that it seems to you that there is somebody, you know, to say the, 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 uh, the mirror is three feet away from you, then the illusion view says it seems to you there is a person about six, week, six feet away from you looking back at you through the glass, and there's not. So it's an illusion. So that's the first view, view one. It perceptually appears there are objects so arranged on the far side of the glass when there aren't an illusion. But the other view is, no, this is not an illusion at all, that, in fact, you see yourself where you are on this side of the glass, there's no, and there's no illusion going on. That's the second view. So my view is that actually both conditions can obtain, in some cases, mirror experiences clearly are illusory. The easiest case is when you don't know that a mirror is present. No particular sensitivity to the mirror. We've all had the experiences of walking into a room uh, that seems much bigger than it is because there's, you know, there's, a, 
there's a mirror there that's reflecting a lot of the room. You don't realize at first it's a mirror. You get the illusion. There's a lot of people over there where there are not. So cases where you don't know a mirror is present, you can very easily get illusions. But I think for an expert user of mirrors who knows a mirror is present, <laughs> there are people who really admire themselves a lot every day. Yeah, there, are, there, need be, uh, there need be no illusions. And actually, I think the best case here is something like the rear view mirror in, uh, in driving a car. And so you're driving a car and looking in the rear view mirror, do the cars in the visible in the mirror, do they involve an illusion? So okay, so here's the, a car's rear view mirror. Okay, so here's two views of what's going on when you look in a rear view mirror. The illusion view says, ah, it appears to you as if there are, you know, there are cars out there in front of you, somehow through that glass, that are weirdly facing towards you, and, but staying at a constant distance from you. And someone asks you, does it look like that? I submit to you that's a counter and very, very counterintuitive and weird way to think about mirror perception of rear view mirrors. I think those cars look to be behind you at a certain distance from you. That's, uh, that's how we naturally think about this, and I think it's actually how we perceive it. Oh, here's another case. Um, see the sunset in the rear view mirror. Does it, uh, the illusion view will say, you know, it looks as if there's a some weird, there's a weird hole in the ground and a sunset through there and this alternative dimension. I don't know what the illusion view is going to say. No, I think it just looks to you as if the, um, the sunset is behind you. So what I'm going to say is phenomenologically, it seems incorrect to say that the cars visible in the mirror appear to be in front of you. The cars appear to be behind you. If we know about mirrors, we're adapted to them, we're using our action in a way which is based on mirrors, and so on, we get the very, very powerful sense that we're perceiving the world as it is. This is a bit like what people call, this is arguably close to a case of what people call cognitive penetration of perception, where what you know or believe makes a difference to how things are perceived as being. In some of these cases, it may be that depending on whether or not you believe something is a mirror, objects may seem to be in front of or behind the glass. I think of this as a kind of cognitive orientation, the kind of way in which our knowledge of the background situation affects how we orient our general perception of the situation. So that's a very quick tour of the case of mirrors. There's a lot more to say about the mirror case. I want to say something analogous goes on for virtual reality. Is the experience of VR an illusion? Are things as they seem to be? I think that it's analogous to the mirror case. So you can get illusions in VR. And the easiest case, as with mirrors, be if you enter a VR without knowing it's a VR, you may well perceive objects as being in front of you in ordinary space when the objects aren't there. So here's, a, here's an illustration. I, guess I like to think that this guy's been on, been on a bit of a bender and was out for a while, and his friends, while well, he was uh, asleep, thought they'd put, play some kind of joke on him and strapped, uh, this is just an old Google Cardboard VR headset to his, uh, his forehead, and he wakes up like, Oh man, I'm in outer space or something, but at least for the first for the first moment or two, doesn't realize this is VR and experiences all this stuff is going on uh, in front of him, doesn't know it's VR. That's an illusion. Okay, so you can get illusions with VR as with mirrors, but what about after much time in VR when you know you're in uh, VR? So here's a so this is Palmer Lucky, the former head of uh, of Oculus, probably the biggest. VR company, which was, uh, which was bought out for two or three billion dollars by Facebook a few, a few years ago, and they've been developing the product. Presumably, he's a very, very expert user of VR, knows perfectly well he's in VR, very sensitized to VR. What I want to say is after some time in VR as an expert user, you adapt to VR, treating it as a separate virtual space with separate virtual objects. You take the objects to be located in virtual space as they are, you perceive the objects as located in virtual space too. So just as you get oriented to using a mirror, you get oriented to using VR, so it's no longer illusory. And that at least fix, fits my own phenomenology of using VR and video games and so on. It's arguable that this kind of cognitive orientation is associated with some kind of distinctive experience. What I think of as the phenomenology of virtuality, you know, the experience of things as virtual, at least, you know, in standard, you know, video games and, v 
and virtual worlds and the like, it's usually pretty clear you know, when objects are, are virtual. And even in augmented realities, the virtual objects are usually marked in some way that makes, you know, maybe they're cartoonish or in some way that makes them clearly distinctive from physical objects. And this brings with it, I think, very often a distinctive phenomenology of virtuality. The virtual objects just immediately seem virtual to us, whereas the non-virtual objects don't. And I think you know, likewise in using VR, even very sophisticated VR, when you know there's virtuality there, this brings about a phenomenology of virtuality. So here's like Magic Leap, the uh, augmented reality thing. Even if there's a fairly convincing elephant um, projected there, nonetheless, you know, you've been using this for a while, you perceive the hands as physical, you perceive the elephant as virtual. And that means that the uh, experience doesn't need to be illusory. I mean, it also may go along with distinctive sort of action affordances, you know, with, just as with mirrors, you know, the, re the review mirror may lead, may correspond to certain kinds of control of action, staying certain distances from the cars behind you. Maybe virtual objects will be, say, visible, audible, but intangible. They'll be associated with certain kinds of, you know, you know, you can put your hands through them. Weird things like that go on in, in, uh, in VR, and that may help with this phenomenology too. So I think that the overall view that I want to put forward here is that there is, I don't want to say fictionalism is completely wrong. I think there is a potential fiction associated with every virtual environment. One where it is interpreted as a physical environment. For any virtual space you're involving with, you can say there is the interpretation where this is a physical environment and it's happening on Earth in a certain place, maybe, that is a, and that is false, that is a fiction. For naive users, that fiction, the interpretation of a virtual world as physical may be salient. And as a result, their experience may be illusory. I'm inclined to think that for sophisticated users of VR, that fiction rapidly becomes non-salient. The interpretation of it as a physical world, they experience the world as virtual, and their experience is not illusory. So that's roughly the view I want to put forward. The fourth question, and interesting in many ways, is the, one, is the question of value in virtual worlds. Our experiences in VR as valuable and as meaningful as experiences outside VR. So here's a book that came out uh, recently called The Revenge of Analog, Real Things and Why They Matter. Somewhat tendentious title, meaning, you know, digital things bad, uh, analog things good, you know, physical things, non-digital things good, you know, CDs, uh, digital streaming bad, records good, e-books bad, paper books good. I mean, I like paper books as much as the next person, so I'm not totally um, unsympathetic. But there's a line, there's a very general line here for thinking that many people have taken as a reason for thinking digital realities are inher inherently limited or in their value, maybe even valueless. And this is a line goes back to the American philosopher Robert Nozick in his classic parable of the experience machine. Um, in his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia around 1974, mostly known for its defense of a libertarian view in political philosophy, but along the way, he has this wonderful story. It involves at least a kind of virtual reality. Nozick says, suppose there was an experience machine that would give you any experience you desired. Super-duper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so you would think and feel you were writing a great novel, or making a friend, or reading an interesting book. All the time you'd be floating in a tank with electrodes attached to your brain. Should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life's experiences? And Nozick asks us that question about the experience machine. Okay, take a moment to, uh, to think about it. But he very clearly expects that we are going to say no. That is not something. I want to do. And I think that is indeed a very natural answer. Many people take this as a reason to reject somehow life inside VR in general. I'm not sure, you know, I think Nozick does have some, re some, some uh, a reasonable case against stepping into the experience machine. It's not totally clear it generalizes to VR. Here are Nozick's three main problems with the experience machine, to simplify. First is the, the thing he mentions towards the end there. It's pre-programmed. You're pre-programming your life's experiences. You'll henceforth be living your life on a script. 
rather than getting to make choices. I always remember this classic case, Judah Dog, of going to, to Disney and it feels like your boat is going left and right over the river, charting its own course, but actually there's, you know, it's attached to the bottom and there's a single track on the bottom of the river and your path down the river is pre-programmed. So, yeah, it seems right that, uh, okay, so experience machine is pre-programmed, no autonomy, that's bad. It's illusory, Nozick says, we want to do things, not just have the experience of doing them, that's bad, and it's artificial. It's a totally human-made reality. We value natural reality, that's bad. So those are Nozick's three reasons for thinking experience machine is bad. Do those reasons apply to VR? I think very important, I think by far, the, my own view is by far the strongest of these reasons is the pre-programming reason, which I think doesn't really apply to VR at all. Inside a virtual world, these worlds are interactive. What you do makes a difference. You can exert your free will, you can make choices, you go into second life, you can make your own life. I mean, maybe certain video games have only very limited autonomy, but more and more complex, realistic virtual worlds will have a lot of autonomy. Hard to see why that's worse in principle than a non-virtual world. I want to argue that VR is not illusory. Um, Nozick thinks we don't really genuinely act in VR. Your avatars don't genuinely do these things. You can see why generalizing the line I'm taking will lead to the conclusion that that's wrong. One really does act in VR. As for the point about artificiality, well, I agree. VR may be artificial, and some people may well value naturalness, but this is obviously not going to be a decisive consideration for many people, you know. Many people live in, in, uh, in cities, in you know, urban spaces like New York City, and you know, for a whole lot of people, that's just fine. Um, you know, it's a perfectly meaningful life. I mean, I understand myself the hankering for natural reality. I like to get out of the city from, uh, from, um, from time to time and enjoy a, a more natural environment. But it certainly doesn't seem there's some blanket over a rule saying you can't have a meaningful life in a city or life in a city is gonna be inherently less meaningful than life outside it. So what I'm inclined to say is that certainly current VR lacks many sources of value in ordinary non-virtual reality. I don't want to say that right now, I mean, people do actually have fairly, um, build fairly extensive communities in places like Second Life, which are pretty valuable to them. I think I want to say that current VR, nevertheless, lacks many sources of value in ordinary non-virtual reality. But Many of them are temporary or inessential lacks. You know, you're not as deeply embodied in current VR. The sensory experiences aren't as rich. The relationships may not be, uh, may not be as rich, especially if they're just you know, short-lived um, VR, virtual worlds. So all of those are you know, somewhat temporary and inessential. Once you get to uh, better versions of the technology with richer embodiment, richer experiences, longer term, more relationships, as in something like, say, Ready Player One, it's unclear. Those differences run deep. I think there are other differences that may run deeper. It's reasonable for some people to value naturalness of reality. It's reasonable to value history. Okay, you know, um, IU is 200 years old. That's kind of cool. And you know, you can value that kind of history. VR, virtual worlds don't yet have that kind of history. So these run deeper, but I don't think these are the kind of things that make the difference between a meaningful life and a meaningless life. So the analogy I find useful is that VR has the same sort, or can have the same sort of value as artificial, newly developed parts of physical. Artificial, newly developed parts of physical reality. So, you know, here's, a, here's an idea. We've got, you know, we used the idea of terraforming bits of reality. Maybe we get to the stage where we can terraform planets. Take a planet and, you know, build it into a new structure, a wonderful paradise or a challenging new environment where we can go and move with our families and, and, uh, and interact, new planets designed for new experiences. Should you move to terraform reality? Well, there's no general answer. Um, it'll lack maybe some sources of value, naturalness, history, maybe some of the people we love to interact with won't be there, and so on. But likewise, there could be many new sources deriving from new experiences. I'm inclined to think something like that is pretty much true of virtual reality, same kind of value that terraform reality has. I'm gonna say terraform reality, it's about as valuable as, um, as ordinary reality, lacks some sources, has some extra sources. VR, 
about as, value as valuable as terraform reality, at least in principle. Therefore, VR is at least in principle about as valuable or can be about as valuable as ordinary um, reality. I mean, exactly, it's, it's going to depend on the preferences and the value structure of an individual, but at least I don't see a big principled obstacle to leading a valuable, meaningful life in VR. And if in the end we do spend a whole lot of time in VR, then um, many sources of value there. This is, of course, not, I don't mean to be um, advocating gung-ho optimism about all aspects of VR. We can all imagine a million ways in which things could go wrong. Um, our privacy could be subverted. Our autonomy could be subverted. People who run these, uh, run these VRs, look what people have done with social networks. I mean, it could be, uh, obviously, there are ways in which that could be squared with VR. Still, I just want to make the more limited claim that I don't see, obst I don't see principled obstacles to, a, to living fully meaningful lives in VR. Okay, finally, I just want to say something very briefly about the underlying philosophical view of reality here. Because I did say that, you know, it's going to partly, there's this project of techno-philosophy. Mostly in this talk, I've been analyzing the philosophical status of the technology, but we might want to bring this back to think about, you know, what does this tell us? Or what does this begin to suggest about reality in general and our relationship to it? And what is the underlying philosophical view that might underpin this virtual realism. I mean, one view that would get you there is idealism. The view that all reality is mental reality. You know, Barclay had the famous slogan, essay es per um, to be is to be perceived. Roughly, it's the idea that appearance is reality. If something feels, looks, and feels like an ordinary reality, then it's, uh, it's real. So you might say that would underpin virtual realism, because if you've got a VR with appearances as of a normal world, the appearances are the same, so the reality is the same too. That might underpin virtual realism. I'm not myself an idealist. Um, I don't want to underpin the view that way. But there's a nearby view, which I think can underpin the view just about as well. And this is the view sometimes known as structuralism about the physical world. This goes along with the idea that there is a physical world outside our minds, but our grasp on physical reality is structural. We grasp it as a certain pattern of causal mathematical structure. Here's a slide I'm going to reuse from the talk yesterday. Wonderful picture of a structural, uh, um, it's a, you've got a structural picture of the physical world. Our understanding, our ultimate understanding, say, of the physical world is in terms of some forms of mathematical and causal structures. Um, we may think we grasp you know, solidity or spatiality as they are in themselves, their intrinsic or categorical nature. I've argued that, in fact, we don't. What we really grasp is their structure. And that ultimately, I think our grasp on physical reality is not different in principle from our grasp on virtual reality. It's really the structure that matters. Um, so in VR, I think, if to say our grip on reality is as this kind of structure, like VR could have that kind of structure. In VR, the structural reality of a physical world can, in principle, be present. Uh, the causal mathematical structure really can exist inside the computer. A computer can replicate that structure in a new medium. In VR, this structure is realized by digital processes. We're in the ordinary world, I mean, if we're in a simulation, all that structure might be realized by digital processes. If not, it's realized by non-digital physical processes. But the same structure can be present either way. So I'd put this by saying that, in principle, VR could have the same causal structure as physical reality, although with different underlying realizers. It's made of different stuff. And what I want to argue is fundamentally being made of that different stuff is not something that makes a difference to its status as reality. VR is a different kind of, the structure is realized differently, so maybe it's a different genus of reality, but it's no less real for that. And indeed, if it turns out that we are ourselves in a VR or in a simulation, then the world is no less real for that because it has the structure that counts. So, you know, here's a few bits and pieces of philosophical upshot for traditional philosophical issues. One is this, uh, one is the idea that, you know, Cartesian skepticism, Descartes' idea, maybe we're being fooled by an evil demon into thinking all this is real, 
Descartes appeals to these skeptical scenarios, dream scenarios, evil demons fooling you. The contemporary version would be the simulation idea. Maybe we're living in a matrix. Uh, the Cartesian wants to say to you, if we're in the matrix, all this is illusory. Well, if the, the virtual realist line I've been putting forward is correct, that might be incorrect. If we're in the matrix, all this is not so illusory. Maybe all this is real. That may make it harder, at least, to get external world skepticism off the ground. Barclayan idealism. Like I said, I don't really, I don't myself endorse Barclayan idealism, but there's an idea um, in Barclay's view that's at least rather consonant with the idea of the world as simulation. That's the idea that God's mind, you know, there's, always, okay, there's appearances in our mind, but what makes our appearances stay there? I look away, I look back, people are still there, the tree and the quad is still there. What sustains all that? Well, on Barclay's view, God's mind. God's mind is sustaining all the structures in physical reality. Um, in a way, it's like God's mind is playing the role of the computer inside the matrix. If this structuralist view is correct, it could be that if God's mind is sustaining external reality, that would also be enough for a non-illusory external world. And I hesitate to, uh, to mention Kant here with the uh, expertise in the, uh, in the, uh, in the audience, but uh, um, I, I, I'm humble about Kant. I know, I, I know nothing about him. That's, Kant, that's my own Kantian humility. But um, Kant, So, you know, Kantian humility is the idea that we don't know the nature of the thing in itself. It's like Kant said, the phenomenal world, the world of appearances that are revealed to us, the underlying nature of reality in itself is not revealed to us. Well, in a way, you get an analog, a very weak analog of this view out of thinking about, uh, thinking about VR. Um, you see, if we're in permanent, perfect virtual reality, then maybe you know, the world in itself out there is a digital reality, even though we can never know that. The phenomenal world, the world of structure, is as it appears to be, but we're ignorant of the thing in itself. And if we turn out to be in, say, a simulated reality, you know, here the thing in itself is what realizes the structure. Maybe that could be turned out to be digital, even though we can never know that. I don't want to say it's a perfect analogy to Kant, but it's a sort of a broadly Kantian um, view of the knowable and unknowable aspects of reality. Of course, if we actually are in a virtual reality that we know that we've constructed ourselves, then we can know that we're in a digital reality to even come to know it and access it. So anyway, those are just some philosophical upshots. I guess my general conclusion then, broadly speaking, is there is a question, I think, that confronts us as we think about virtual worlds playing a bigger and bigger role in our lives. Is virtual reality, is it just a second-class reality? It's like an entertainment, um, a diversion that's useful for, uh, for fictional purposes, but not really the real uh, the real thing, or is it a, uh, a first-class reality? Is it kind of a genuine reality? I think it's a very natural and common view that virtual reality is always going to be doomed to be a kind of a second-class reality, but my own view is, you know, what makes something real and what gives it its value is largely invested by us as conscious beings in interaction with those worlds. And I think insofar as VR can have the right kind of structure, even though it's, say, it's made of different stuff, VR is not actually a second class, need not be a second class reality. It has everything it takes to be a genuine reality. Thanks. Um, I'd like to fall back on my uh, origins as a theoretical physicist and ask you if you are ready to comment on the holographic principle. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the, uh, this is kind of tied to this ADS-CFT duality. That's correct. With, uh, yeah, the, uh, what's going on on the surface of the, uh, of the sphere is isomorphic to what's going on inside it? Not isomorphic. Not isomorphic. What is no, it? No, th there is no inside. That, that's the point, is that there is no 3D reality, that the reality is essentially the result of the boundary conditions of the differential equations on the lower dimensional I space. So you start off with the duality between the surface and what's inside, and then some people go on to take the, uh, the further step that, you know, maybe the surface... I do. What's that? I do. I go on to that. Okay. Oh, you do? Okay. I, I, would, I would love to read this. I mean, in a way, I think of that as consistent with the kind of structuralism I'm articulating here. There's a structural isomorphism between the surface of the sphere and the insides. And whenever physicists see these structural isomorphisms or these dualities, they say, great, let's collapse them. Let's just say there's, a, there's only one thing. Uh, there's one thing here. As a philosopher, I don't know, I, want to, I always want to be careful about 
making uh, that move. And I've seen some philosophers argue that, in fact, it's not a perfect isomorphism, so we should be careful about this. But if it's true, um, you know, if it's true, it's a kind of it's a very deep form of uh, of onto in this okay in this paper in this talk. I haven't, there's a view called ontological structuralism. It's quite popular in philosophy. It says all there is to physical reality is its structure. And somebody of a structuralist leaning might well say, in this case, with those isomorphisms, yeah, the structure is all there is. Let's say the surface is all there is. I'm, my view in this paper is closer to what's sometimes called epistemological structuralism. Our grasp on physical reality is via its structure, but it may also have some underlying intrinsic character for example, if we're in a simulation, it may be digital processes underneath all this. I think epistemological structuralism makes it a bit harder to get this collapse from the holographic principle because the mere existence of a structural isomorphism might be consistent, say, with different realizers of the structure on the surface of the sphere and elsewhere. But it's, yeah, it's a fascinating question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk, very interesting. Um, one of the things that came up for me is you talk about realities that are you know digital immersive and you know interactive and then you say that physical reality is an example of one that is not digitally generated um, have you considered um, states such as dreaming or what clinicians may call like exotic states of consciousness ketamine anesthesia are those as valid as the virtual ones are there a sort of liminal space what do you think about those kinds of states? Uh, I think the dreaming case is interestingly analogous. In principle, dreams are kinds of virtual environments, but they're immersive, they're interactive. They're not exactly computer generated, but they're generated at least by other bits of our own brain. And much of what I say might, in principle, apply to them. There are a few disanalogies. Um, one is that dreams are less, much less stable and much more fragmentary and so on. Also, with a dream, typically you don't know you're in a dream, um, whereas in these VRs, you know you're in a VR. Maybe a lucid dream, though. A very, very stable, non-fragmentary lucid dream could be beginning to be analogous. The other difference, I think, is that when people talk about something being real, I think they mean many things, but one of the important criteria often introduced is mind independence, independence of our minds. So, the computer in the matrix, I think, meets that condition. It's actually largely independent. It's running independently of us. If my mind stops, it can keep going. Dreams, on the other hand, are, seem to be weirdly dependent on our minds. It's us that's generating them. So you might say that, that gives them you know, one, degree, one degree less of, of genuine independent reality insofar as we want to be interacting with a mind independent environment. You don't get that in a dream. Nonetheless, I think an awful lot of the rest of what I said could apply at least to an ideal case of a dream. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to try to wrap this back to uh, some points you made in yesterday's conversation. And um, mine is, if mirrors are illusory until you become uh, cognitively oriented to the nature of the illusion of the mirror, then if you take an illusionist perspective of consciousness, if you become cognitively oriented to the nature of consciousness, does it cease to be illusionary? Hmm. Yeah, could you take everything I said here about mirrors and VR and apply it to consciousness? I instinctively want to say no, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me think. Uh, so we're gonna, how are we going to get cogn cognitively oriented to consciousness? Are we, is the idea we're not conscious, but, we'll, but we treat it as if it, we are conscious or vice versa? I suppose treating it that we are conscious, but understanding the nature of the illusion of consciousness. See, so, um, so one thing might be, just say we are illusionists, um, but we think we're, uh, we're conscious. You might just run with the illusion and get cognitively oriented to it. And I mean, one question is, just say you could, here's an interesting, I mean, the, the, I mentioned Patricia Churchland earlier. She and Paul Churchland are, were eliminative materialists who thought we don't use, need to use mental vocabulary to understand our minds, but very naturally we tend to, naively, we understand our minds using mental vocabularies. What if we became expert theorists of the mind who learned to understand the brain just using, um, just using a physical uh, reality? So, you know, Pat Schlossen said at one point, you know, 
like maybe instead of saying I've got a really bad headache now, it's like, oh my, dopamine is going crazy, or I don't know what it is. Um, then, uh, then maybe you could, you know, you could you could come to interpret the mind through uh, through say a physiological or non-mental vocabulary. Maybe that would be the analogy to cognitive orientation. You would come to see the introspective brain not as a mind, but as a brain. Now, as a matter of fact, I think that's very very. Um, that's very, very difficult. I think probably much harder than this, uh, this VR or mirror orientation. That said, Pat and Paul Churchland, they raised their two kids this way. They both went into neuroscience. They're now among the leading, Mark and Ann Churchland are now among the leading neuroscientists um, in the world. And I think, you know, I, don't, I talked to them. I said, do you actually introspect that way? I said, well, not exactly, but maybe, maybe <laughs> they're getting closer. It's a long-term project. But so maybe there's some prospects for a cognitive orientation there. Maybe someday. <laughs> Hi, um, I had a question concerning more uh, the topic of morality. So as you said towards the end of your speech, you if VR is not taken as a sort of second class reality and it is one, would there be a difference between like an immoral and moral action in a VR setting versus a like life setting? Um, and if so, like where would the differentiation be? Where would it, would it be in an internal sense? Would it be in like a, con like a visible or affected consequence sense or kind of where would your thoughts on that be? Yeah, I guess I'm inclined to say yes in principle, though there are quite a lot of disanalogies in practice, at least in the, uh, in the near term. One is that, you know, virtual reality is a much more disposable for now. You know, you kill another person's avatar in, in a VR battle game. Well, okay, you've not done something horribly immoral. Why? Because for a start, you didn't kill the person. You know, it's like a, they're, still, uh, they're still alive in the, uh, in the outside world. Maybe, it, maybe it's a little bit analogous to a... It turns out in World of Warcraft, when you die, I was thinking, what happens when you die in World of Warcraft? And there's somebody saying, oh, yeah, death is a real drag in World of Warcraft. You've got to go to the nearest graveyard and <laughs> resurrect yourself um, and so on. So it's like maybe there's a form of, sometimes there's resurrection, sometimes there's reincarnation, you know, you act, or sometimes you just move on to the afterlife. So maybe it's not so bad. But um, so, you know, the status of birth and death, I think, is, is probably quite different. Also, the status of bodies are different, we're differently attached to our avatar bodies and to our physical bodies, but that said, people do uh, grow seriously attached to their, to their avatar bodies and people do experience you know, violations of bodily autonomy and so on in VR. And I think this is very much a, uh, a question of how strongly you, you know, identify your, with your body and maybe with a very casual use of uh, the VR, it's not a strong, a strong identification, so it doesn't carry the same kind of moral weight but you know, I think over time, as people develop attitudes towards VR that are analogous to our attitudes towards physical realities, and I think the moral stakes will begin to get uh, will begin to get higher. Likewise, when it comes to things like theft and so on, do you steal virtual money from someone in a in say Second Life, and that can be, yeah, that can be a, I think a uh, moral transgression, very much analogous to doing something similar in the non-virtual life. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted like I just listened to your like lecture about like uh, the VR and the physical reality about like it depends on like different structure. So I just wanted like to ask like a general questions about like philosophy. So how do you think like a uh, perception that you feel like every day is that real or not real in your op opinion? Let me say real. So how do you like uh, define that it's real? For like a perception, for example, like that is a chair, then and I just received that, and it's a thing like the consciousness that I feel that is a chair. Is that a real thing, or? Yeah. So I want to go beyond. This reminds me of in in the Matrix, Morpheus asked, you know, what is reality, Neo? How do you define real? If reality is just what you see and hear and taste, and ultimately it's just electrical signals in your brain. And there Morpheus is kind of channeling Barclay by saying, if reality is just appearance, then it's all in the mind. And I want to reject that idea of reality, that it's all just a matter of how it seems to you. But it is a really interesting question, what is it to be real? I don't think you're going to find a good definition, but there are some criteria that philosophers and others have put forward. There's one due to the Australian metaphysician Samuel Alexander, who said, uh, to be real is to have causal powers. If you can actually affect things in the world, then to that extent, you're real. 
I don't think that's definitional. I think there could be things that are real that didn't have causal powers. I do think if you have causal powers, you're real. Virtual objects can do that. Um, I mentioned also the criterion of mind independence. The science fiction author, Philip K. Dick, once put this by saying, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Um, <laughs> it's a rough idea that it doesn't depend on your mind. And then there's other forms of mind dependence. I think virtual objects can also, can also have that. Um, there are a few other criteria for reality you can have. I'm inclined to think virtual objects meet almost all of them. The one that I worry about is um, the philosopher J.L. Austin said uh, reality, real is what he called a, is it a trouser word, it, like it needs a, it always needs a compliment. You can't just say a real thing. You've got to say is it a real chair or a real uh, computer or a real carpet. So one question, say I go into VR, I interact with a virtual chair. Is it real? Is it a real thing? Absolutely. Is it a real chair? I don't know. I want to say it's a real virtual chair. <laughs> um, so in the Austin sense of being a real X, I think you could maybe make the case that, yeah, virtual cars are not actually real cars. They're, I had a debate, with, had a discussion of this with some students yesterday. I said, are, like, yeah, are virtual hands real hands? Are virtual cars, cars, real cars? Some of them said yes. I think it's kind of a, it's a matter of how loose you are with language. Some of them said no, but I think that's the one criterion that these things may fail. But otherwise, I think they pass this checklist for concepts of reality. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, so I think I have a friendly suggestion or diagnosis um, about the oh. experience machine and uh, why it's bad. <laughs> uh, it seems significant in the case that uh, we run away from our lives permanently. <laughs> We escape our own lives and abandon our own posts. There's something cowardly about that. Whereas I think like you could vacation in the experience machine, right? Or uh, in, another, in another case, like if I were born into the matrix and I never found out, I think I could have a perfectly meaningful life. And really what's driving the intuition here is this sort of cowardliness. I don't know what you think about that. So it's used like it's, yeah, it's a worry to kind of escapism. How do you feel about, you know, I mean, people moving to the other side of the world, say people you know, emigrating from, uh, from, uh, from Asia to Australia or some such to make, a, uh, to make a new life. I mean, people do this and you know, for, all kinds of, uh, for all kinds of reasons and maybe sometimes it's cowardly but sometimes it's brave um, and so on. I guess I'm inclined to think that going into uh, virtual reality could have all of those reasons. I mean, maybe sometimes it's for reasons of escape, but sometimes we, there'll be opportunities. Maybe there's going to be like, just as there are jobs might be available in another country. Maybe there'll be forms of work available inside virtual reality that weren't available outside, and people are going to make the, cho the choice to go in, uh, going to go in for that reason. And if they do, then I think it's going to have roughly the same moral status as, say, moving, moving to, a different, uh, to a different country. And of course, when you go into VR, Another difference between VR and the experience machine is it looks like in Nozick's experience machine, you don't get to come back. I don't know, it depends how you develop it. But um, he does say pre-programming your life experiences. Um, whereas in VR, you've always got the choice of, uh, of coming back and traveling back and visiting your, your loved ones and so on. So I, think, I do think you're right that this is part of the force of uh, the anti-experience machine intuition is the idea that we're just leaving our old and escaping from our old reality wholesale. And that, yeah, to the extent you have this two-way communication, then that, I think, makes it more palatable. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the last part, the for, the value question. Um, and in particular, I wanted to ask about, like, so there might be valuable experiences you could have in a virtual world or the real world, or there might just be valuable things in the real world and the virtual world. So, like, even if no one experiences it, you might think that, like, the fact that a great artwork is there or something is itself valuable. Yep. Um, and I want to know what you think about like that kind of existential value in the virtual world. Because I, I mean, I admit, maybe it's just because um, virtual worlds aren't as complex as the real world, or they haven't e existed for as long or something like that. But I admit that like, if you were, my intuition is if you were to destroy the entire universe, it's kind of a bad thing to do. Um, if you were to shut down the server that had a simulation of the entire universe on someone's VR headset, we don't lose the same kind of value. Um, so I wonder, is it just a question of we need more time to build more valuable structures in VR, or if there's like a real difference here between 
the two types of existence. In principle, there are analogies here. Certainly, I think it is possible there could be hidden value in VR. There are, you know, there are virtual worlds people have made already that have like Easter eggs that are very hard to find. And maybe there are Easter eggs that have never been found. And you might say, still, the fact that there is this Easter egg in this video game that no one has ever found gives it an extra special bit of value. Maybe someday someone will find it. Maybe not. Either way, it has a bit of a bit of value. So I do think that at least in principle, there are analogies there. Yeah, I don't want to say that shutting down a simulated universe on the currently existing VR sense has got the same kind of moral status as destroying uh, this universe. For a start, but if you destroy this universe, you're going to uh, you're going to kill billions of people at the very least. Um, no. VR, no simulated universe we have now, seems to, seems to support anything like genuine conscious life. So, but just say you really did have a desktop simulation of a universe almost as complex as ours, and just say, big supposition, this really did support billions of conscious entities, then I think it yeah, really does raise the question of if we, if we were to destroy that, would we be doing something about as monstrous as destroying this universe? Um, especially, I mean, I think, it's even more monstrous that this universe is the basic universe. If you destroy that, you destroy everything. If it turns out this universe is a simulated universe, then you've destroyed billions of people, but maybe there are other people who go on in the next, next level up. Either way, pretty monstrous. I think at least in principle, the analogies are there. With current VR technology, of course, the analogies are weak. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your argument against uh, illusionism about VR. Um, and it's, it seems like it relies on uh, this analogy to uh, mirrors and being expert users of VR and being able to recognize it as VR. Um, but it seems to me that that's a contingent fact that we would be able to recognize it as VR, especially as uh, VR gets more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, um, it seemed like you admitted that um, certain cases of mirrors, we can't dispel the illusion. Yeah. So I was wondering, as we get more sophisticated about VR, do, we, do you think that... Um, VR being real is going to be contingent on being able to recognize it as such. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So yeah, deep fake VR. Um, we've already got like deep fake photos and videos that are produced by AI, AI systems to put words in the mouths of familiar people, and maybe this could happen with VR too. And the VR could become so convincing that it's indistinguishable from normal reality, and maybe people will find a way to put headsets on us so we don't actually know we're in VR. I certainly think that can happen in principle. And when that happens in principle, it's very possible that people can then get illusions. So if, if there's VR, if people undergo VR that they don't recognize as VR, then they may well take it to be, uh, to be, uh, to be physical, and then they'll be misled. I do think if this becomes common, then we're going to become suspicious, as we already are, of you know, Photoshop and, uh, and so on. And then we're going to rely on something like authentication. We're going to rely on signs that this is actually I think what people will probably do is, in order not to confuse people too badly, people are going to make sure, like, you know, good faith generators of VR are going to make sure that VR virtual items are marked as virtual so people don't get, uh, don't get confused. And so people will get the, the phenomenology of virtuality. And if this, is, if this is out there a lot, people are going to look for signs of authenticity, like authentication, um, some marker that this is actually a genuine VR. Or I don't know how you get authentication in physical reality. But yeah, there is going <laughs> interesting. Just say it became really common that we had deep fake VRs. Then would physical reality have to come with marks of authentication? Like you give a little wave that people can only do in physical reality to prove that <laughs> we're in we're in physical space now. I'm not a deep fake, and so on. But maybe that's the kind of thing it would uh, it would uh, it would take. Anyway, I certainly want to allow in principle that there's the possibility of illusions here, and the way I am thinking of it working is resting on the possibility of recognition. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk and. Uh, so it was pretty convincing for me that virtual stuff are real, uh, but for myself, um, I try to reconcile this in a way that, okay, there's a virtual chair and it's real, but it's different, uh, it has a different reality than the real chair that we see in here. So that's that, like we have electron, it's real, we have positron, it's real, they're both real, but they have their different natures of reality. But how can we extend this to consciousness? So what are the criteria for a virtual consciousness to be real? And is it the same way real that a virtual chair is real? Or we can make it some, in a way, that it is as real as a uh, biological consciousness that we have here? Yeah, I mean, I'm hesitant to make analogies between what I'm saying here about physical reality 
and consciousness, because although I'm a structuralist about physical reality, I'm not a structuralist about consciousness. I do think we have some kind of, I said, you know, we don't really grip the intrinsic nature of space or of solidity, but I do think we have some kind of grip on the intrinsic nature of consciousness. So I think the analogy, you've got to be very careful about the analogies. That said, I am, as it happens, sympathetic with the possibility of artificial consciousness. I think if you replicate, although I think consciousness is not reducible to the structure of our brains, I think if you replicate the structure of our brains in a different medium, my own view is that we'll probably replicate our state of consciousness. So in principle, there could be, um, just as I think there can be structural duplicates of this world in a different medium that are just as real, although different, I think there could be structural duplicates of our brains in a different medium, say a digital medium, that are just as conscious. So the critical factor in here would be the causal links between the units inside the system so that it recreates the consciousness? Yeah, that is, uh, my own view is that roughly what matters for consciousness is something like the informational, or my very tentative view is some kind of informational or computational structure. Um, so if you've, got the, if you've got the structure right, you're going to get the consciousness right. One way I get there is through thinking about thought experiments where you gradually transform from one system to another, gradually replace the biological parts by isomorphically functioning silicon parts, and then think about what happens to your consciousness as you gradually transform the system. And I've tried to, in other work, I've tried to argue that, yeah, the choices are either your consciousness gradually fades out or it suddenly jumps and disappears. I've tried to argue those are implausible, and therefore you've got the case for isomorphism preserves consciousness. So that's roughly the line I would try to take there. Thank you for a really thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about um, your use of the terms naive users and sophisticated users. And um, do correct me if I'm not getting uh, exactly what you said, right, of reading from my own notes. But this came up where you were um, raising the possibility, I think, of there being a distinctive phenomenology of virtuality. And uh, as part of a cognitive orientation where one, what one knows or believes makes a difference to how things are perceived. And I must admit I approach this topic today less as a user of virtual reality than as a teacher and reader of novels. So I was really interested in the comparisons you were making uh, with fiction. And I'm, and I'm struck by the thought that just for a moment thinking in terms of naive and sophisticated readers of novels, um, Often within the discipline of literary studies, um, it's the opposite of what I took you to be suggesting about naive and sophisticated users of virtual reality. If I was understanding you correctly, use the term naive user of virtual reality as someone who can't get over the fact that it's a, a fiction or an illusion. Whereas in, in literary studies, according to sophisticated literary critics, um, the, the problem with naive readers is they're all too inclined to think of characters as real people. Uh, that they're not sensing that these are rhetorical manipulations and designs uh, by, the, by the author. And interestingly enough, there's a movement now in literary studies by certain critics like Rita Felsky in a new book on character to get so-called sophisticated readers of fiction to acknowledge that there is worth and validity in seeing characters as real people. You know, sometimes that, that can be valuable. I think what this all comes down to is that for a lot of us, sophisticated or not, often when we read fiction, we oscillate back and forth between uh, understanding that these are uh, literary creations by the author and really getting involved with their adventures and their plights and their struggles, uh, thinking of them as real, um, as real. So I'm wondering how far or how helpful uh, thinking of naive and sophisticated users are, whether that's maybe gets us into perhaps too sharp a division, whereas really we, a lot of people can oscillate back and forth between the, the two positions that might be marked out by those terms. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. I've not thought about this carefully. Um, I guess I'm inclined to think there are probably some disanalogies between the VR case and the fiction case, not least because I don't think VR actually involves fiction. So I think the truth about VR is different from the truth about fiction. Also, your naive and sophisticated views are almost like philosophical views towards the, the creatures of fiction. And one could make a similar analogy towards uh, VR, whether or not you regard these things as real. 
But my distinction between naive and sophisticated users of VR was actually a somewhat different distinction. The, naive, the naive one was a really naive one. They didn't actually know they were using VR. The naive <laughs> user of mirrors. I mean, the really naive ones don't even know they're using mirrors. Or maybe it's just the mirror for the very first time and they're totally confused by what's going on. The sophisticated one is just someone who's used it a lot. Now, among those sophisticated users, people who have actually used VR a lot, the philosophical views may vary. They do vary among people who use VR. Some of them think all this is illusions. Some of them think all this is uh, real. I think, I think these things are real. The mapping this onto you, the ones who think they're real would be naive. The ones who think they're illusions would be sophisticated. Or if we went, now if we went from the point of view of my philosophy, I'd say no, the ones who think they're real are sophisticated. The ones who think they're illusions are, uh, are naive. And that's just a question of which, whose philosophical view is correct. I mean, I think I would prefer not to use the words naive and sophisticated for those philosophical views because I think both views are available. There are sophisticated versions of both fictionalism and, uh, and realism. So I didn't really mean to be marking that distinction here. That said, um, I do suspect there's going to be analogs of some of the issues that you mentioned in the, in the VR case, except I think it's going to be, for these reasons, it's going to be much less clear which philosophical view is naive and which one is, is sophisticated. Right, right. Yeah, that's going to depend on the philosopher. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Speed up the answers too. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to ask a quick question then. Uh, so I guess Mike, uh, where I'm grappling with is the distinction uh, between kind of like a manipulatable world and one that we don't understand how we can manipulate it. And so the, the analogy that I would use is that when I was standing here, if you just disappeared right in front of me, the only way I could explain that is that oh, that was an illusion in front of me. Uh, but if I was in a virtual world, I might be able to say, well, a piece of code was deleted, the structure changed, and you know, I can grapple with this. And does something about like my inability to understand why, like I, I guess if I can understand how the world can be manipulated so easily, does that make it less real than if I just don't understand what's around me? If you understand it, does that make it less real? So you understand how things work. Why is it that understanding how things work would make them less real? Um, tr tr troubling to verbalize it. Uh, like, I guess, I guess it came back to the illusion type of idea is that uh, when, when I look in the car and see the car behind me in a mirror, in fact, like, I expect that car to be behind me and that's not really an illusion. Uh, however, in a game, if that car wasn't behind me and I expected it to be, it, you know, there's a, some amount of illusion there that I can rationalize as being part of this world that I don't, I, I don't know. There's I guess like maybe I'm not. Violations of, some people say when the world, to, to be real, the world has to surprise you. So when the world does unexpected things, maybe that's a genuine sign of reality. If it only ever does what you expect it to do, then maybe that's a sign that you know, the, the world is not so autonomous of you and your, uh, and your expectations. So maybe if you then, yeah, if you understood things too well, it's like, oh no, I want, you know, it's a criterion of reality, that reality's gotta have the ability to go beyond my understanding. Maybe that's not quite. Yeah, I don't think I verbalized it criterion you perfectly, but thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my question arises from some, some of the examples that you used throughout. Um, you used examples like Second Life, uh, the um, Ready Player One film, and sort of World of Warcraft. And all those games involve interaction with other avatars, yes, but those avatars are guided by other uh, real people. Um, so I'm just curious if you feel that virtual reality experiences in sort of single player games where you're interacting with uh, like Nozix machine pre-programmed interactions which as real as they might seem are pre-programmed, are, are those experiences just as valid as something in Ready Player One or Second Life? Yeah, so I, yeah, that's good. I didn't talk very much in this talk about the status of other people that you're interacting with inside virtual reality. I guess I was assuming as a default model, something like the Second Life model, where the other creatures, your other people you're interacting with are all controlled by conscious minds from perhaps from the non-virtual world. But of course there are many cases in many actual uh, virtual environments, the 
quote, people you're interacting with are mostly non-player characters who have a fairly limited repertoire of, uh, of behaviors. And you know, we don't want to count them as being genuine people or having moral status and so on. And if we, if we went into a version of the experience machine where the only people we interacted with were these non-player characters with just little pseudo-minds, then yeah, that would be pretty bleak. That would be like living in a solipsistic universe where you're the only, um, you're the only conscious person. Um, that said, maybe there could be you know, other cases. Maybe as AI gets better and better, maybe they'll end up being virtual. There'll be beings, there'll be people we interact with who aren't, don't correspond to conscious minds from outside the virtual world. They're endogenous to the virtual world, but their computational processes are sophisticated enough. Maybe they'll, in the end, being at human level or more. And if I'm right about, if my views about consciousness are correct, they will also be conscious too. And then you could have, well, these will be non-player characters in the sense of not coming from the outside world, but they'll still be player characters in the sense of being conscious. I think maybe you could actually have meaningful interactions with, um, with them, but that, I mean, that's science fiction right now. The cases which are available, the cases which are available to us right now are either very simple non-player characters, yeah, which I don't think bring, bring very much meaning to our lives. I don't want to say none. You know, people have, people have pets, people have robot pets that bring, uh, bring meaning to their lives. People can have interactions with avatars that may bring some meaning to their lives, but I don't think it's the kind we get from interaction with another conscious being. So for now, to get that kind of meaning in VR, at least it's got to be interaction with another person from outside the VR. Thank you. Hello. Um, so my question is sort of pertaining to the nature of like mental illness, perhaps. So like, what would be your response to like the somewhat like, I guess, inflammatory statement that was made about like schizophrenic people are legit living in like some version of a virtual reality, like schizophrenic people momentarily like enter in and out of a virtual reality and maybe this only um maybe you would say that this is like completely just like an illusion for them similar to like the um illusion of mirrors um whenever you're a you know maybe they're naive users um how much you respond yeah I've, I've talked about this with a few schizophrenic people actually and i think you know the, it's complicated and i think the case is actually a very different uh, with different people but um at least a, uh, a couple of people I've talked about this uh, this with have been sort of broadly sympathetic to the whole um, to to the whole framework. And very strongly have the sense that even though they know that this is somehow brain generated, they feel there is some kind of reality that they're uh, they're interacting with. And I think it's kind of analogous. I mean, my very rough approach would be it's very very roughly analogous to the case of dreams, even though there are many many many, many differences, at least at the beginning, you know, you take all these things to be part, you might take certain things to be part of ordinary physical reality, and that's probably illusory. That's a bit like the, uh, what I was saying about the mirror case or the naive user of VR. After a while, you may come to recognize, oh, actually, these are things happening inside your mind that you're interacting with, and that changes your attitude, uh, that may change your attitude towards them. But I think, at least from some of the people I've talked to, they nonetheless have the sense that when they have these hallucinations, yeah, what they're interacting with is real. Yes, it's mind independent, but nevertheless, nevertheless real. It's a different kind of reality. Maybe there's a way of vindicating that kind of intuition here. That said, I think, you know, probably every, every schizophrenic subject is gonna be different in, uh, in different ways, and I don't wanna put forward a big generalizing treatment of them. <laughs> 